the song Silent Night, we think of sleeping in heavenly peace. But so many silent nights are filled with doubt. There's a thought that occurred to me this week when I was putting this message together, and that is we have a tendency of making superheroes out of Bible characters. They were just human. But there's a tendency, like for instance, we know that Samson was a superhero, but not when he was getting that haircut that you read about. He was very human. And you will discover as you go through the passages in the Bible, the characters that are used in the Bible, they were great characters, but they still had silent nights of doubt. And I just like to rearrange the Christmas story in a moment just to bring it into focus. We know that Noah was a man of faith because the Bible says by faith Noah divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household. Now we know he had faith because the Bible says he had faith. In fact, the scripture says that Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Look at that phrase, not yet seen. That's where faith grows. It is also where doubt grows. When we don't understand something, it's so easy for doubt to spring up like a weed sometimes. And when I'm thinking about Noah, I'm thinking about the fact that God asked him to build a boat. Now, some commentators think it took 50 years or 120 years to build this boat. Whatever it is, it doesn't matter other than it took a long time to build a boat. But there's no doubt in my mind during those years, the decades that, that he was working on the boat, that he had some what ifs. It only stands to reason. He would think thoughts like this. What if, after building this boat, it doesn't rain? The thought had to occur to him. What if it does rain, but there's no flood? That's another doubt. What if it rains, there is a flood, but the boat don't float? <laughs> another doubt. What if it rains, there's a flood, the boat floats, but it leaks and sinks. These are the kind of doubts that anybody that was involved in a project of that size would have thought there would have been some silent nights when you were just wondering. And if that's not convincing, let's go to the last day when all of the animals went into the boat and Noah and his family entered the boat and God shut the door. Bam! Now he's inside the boat with his wife, his three sons, and their wives. One day goes by. No rain. Two days go by. No rain. On the third day, Mrs. Noah was looking at Mr. Noah with the suggestion, of, are you sure? I mean, you, I hope you're really sure that this is the right thing to do because there are people outside making fun and ridiculing and mocking us right now. Four days go by, five days go by, six days go by. It wasn't until the seventh day that it started to rain. You know that there had to be some silent nights of doubt. And if you go through the stories in the Bible, you will discover the same thing is over and over and over, played out again. When Joseph was thrown into prison for a crime he did not commit, two and a half years in that prison, he had to be having some silent nights of doubt. Moses is 40 years in a wilderness. You know that some of those nights had to be filled with what is going on. And we know for sure, in fact, there's no doubt about it, when David was running from King Saul from cave to cave, he had plenty of silent nights of doubt because he writes about them in the Psalms. So the fact that these great Bible characters had some silent nights of doubt it shouldn't surprise us, number one, that the Christmas story would be filled with some doubts. And also, when we face doubts, because we will, we need to know what we can do about them. So I'm going to bring in the Christmas story. 
the angel comes to Mary and the angel says, uh, you shall give birth, you will conceive and give birth to a child. He shall be the Savior, call his name Jesus. She understood immediately that this is the Messiah and she asked the question, how can this be? That's the first doubt. Then Mary told Joseph a story and Joseph, he didn't believe it. He didn't believe it because there was a time when he was thinking about putting his wife away, divorcing her. It wasn't until the angel came to Joseph and told him, don't you be afraid. You can take Mary to be your wife. He had silent nights of doubt. And we fast forward now nine months and Caesar Augustus decrees that the entire world should be taxed. That's pretty ambitious. And because of that, since Joseph and Mary's ancestry came from Bethlehem, Joseph and Mary had to travel to Bethlehem. It was a 70-mile trip over rough terrain. Mary is nine months pregnant. I wonder what Joseph was thinking. We turn to Luke, the second chapter, and this is what it says. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. She is having labor pains. Now they're looking for a place where she could give birth to the Christ child. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. There is no doubt in my mind that Joseph and Mary, both of them, had a silent night of doubt. And I would imagine Joseph was thinking, something is wrong here. If the child is supposed to be the king of kings and lord of lords, he's he's being born in the wrong place. He, He should have a palace, but I don't understand. No room, no room in the inn, and now we have a manger where the child is going to be born. I think, and this is where conspiracy theories come, I think God did not plan ahead. Have you ever had that thought? God, if you were planning ahead, you would have fill in the blank. And maybe he even thought that Caesar Augustus messed up the plan of God because now he and Mary are in a manger and giving birth to a child in a flea-infested animal shelter. Doubts. They come to all of us. And I am sure Joseph did not connect the dots in Matthew in Micah 5 2, which says, But thou Bethlehem of Ephratah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me one to be ruler. I don't think Joseph was thinking about the Old Testament prophecy when he was in the manger with Mary after giving birth to Jesus. So the fact that there are doubts in the Christmas story is really not a surprise. And and I just want to make sure that this is very contemporary because the truth is we all have doubts. Every one of us have doubts, especially when we get a promise from God. You get a promise from God, it almost seems that the very next thing that happens is circumstances change for you to doubt the promise that God gave you. When Nancy and I came to California, God gave Nancy and a scripture verse And it was, I will call you from the east and gather you from the west. And I thought, that is cute. How appropriate is that? It's going to call us from the east and then gather us from the west. The gathering from the west was a little. But that's the promise that we had. And then for about a year, uh, Nancy and I were uh, associate pastors at this church I did a Tuesday night Bible study, a Friday night movie, and also I worked in the printing shop, and Nancy Ann single-handedly started a Sunday school program at the church. At the end of the year, both of us took a group of 30 or 40 people to the Holy Land on a tour, and we were staying at the King David Hotel in Jerusalem, which is still there, when this is what happened. There was a knock on the door. The pastor's wife came into our room in tears and just said this, it's all over. I didn't understand what that was. I said, what 
is all over. She said the church is dissolving. There is no more church. I am 7,000 miles away from home. You can be sure Nancy and I had a couple of sleepless nights and some silent nights of doubt. Because whenever something happens that you weren't expecting, something just suddenly appears and it's a difficulty, or it certainly looks like a difficulty, you doubt it. You don't understand it, so you doubt. If it's not logical, you doubt it. If it's not reasonable, you doubt it. If it's a weird story, you doubt it because you don't understand it. And when the things that we don't understand and things that confuse us automatically become the fertilizer for doubts to grow in your life and in my life. Sometimes we have to live with these doubts for a long time, but they are there. But the Christmas story tells us something, teaches us something about how to handle the doubts that come our way. And I guess I could capsulize it in this statement. The wisdom for the person who has a doubt needs to simply hold on. Hold on. Don't go anywhere. Don't make any changes. Don't make any rash decision. Hold on. Oh, just hold on to whatever it is that God promised you. And God is going to make it. He, he's, he knows how to make it work out. And he's going to make it work out. This is how it worked out in the Christmas story. Luke 2, verse 8. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. These are the little lambs that would be used in the temple for sacrifices. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. You're afraid. You don't need to be afraid, because I got joy to give you, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. They understood that to mean the Messiah. Christ the Lord, the anointed one, the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. So the angel gave the shepherds a sign. This is how you're going to know that what I'm telling you is true that the Savior has been born, you'll find him wrapped in swaddling clothes and you'll find him lying in a manger. It's a sign. But the big sign was not to the shepherds. Mary and Joseph are in the manger holding on. There wasn't anything else they could do. Holding on to the promise that the angel gave Joseph and Mary This is the Christ child. Don't understand it. It shouldn't be this way. He should have been born somewhere else in a better environment. But this is hold. And they held on. And while they were holding on, the shepherds walk in and tell them the story that the angels told them. And it became the sign to Joseph and Mary because it was now a confirmation. They would have no way of knowing But what they were thinking was, if the shepherds knew what they couldn't possibly have known, if they knew what God had already told us, this must be true. That is how doubts vanish. When God confirms it in some way, it's a matter of holding on. But here's the truth. The truth of this story and the truth of everyone else's story. God will confirm his promises to you. And it will take time. But he knows what he's doing and we have to give him the right to do what he believes needs to be done. But the doubts will continue. Some doubts will vanish. And they will be replaced by other doubts. Life is a struggle. The very fact that I'm calling life a struggle means there are going to be doubts because we don't always understand struggle. 
And when the struggle comes and the confusion comes and we don't understand and we have to grapple with another problem, it becomes a time of doubt. And so I'm thinking about the story of, of Mary, Joseph, and Jesus. And Mary was going to doubt again. When Jesus overturned the tables in the temple, don't you think his mother doubted? What does that mean? And when Jesus stood before a crowd of people, maybe 5,000 or more people, and said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part in the kingdom, don't you think that that would have caused Mary to doubt? What does that mean? And when our own children, Jesus' brothers, did not accept Jesus and doubted him, create intention in the family, don't you think Mary would have had a few silent nights of doubt? But the wisdom is the same. It's true for us as it was true for them. Hold on. Because we don't have anything else to do. We have to hold on. With the belief of the song that we, I used to sing when we were kids, I'm, I'm sure we all know it. We'll understand it better by and by. Lord, I wish I could understand it today, but sometimes it's by and by. I want to give you an illustration, and I want to cl close with this, and that is here's a chick inside of an egg, and it's developing like all chicks do. They grow inside the egg. And while the chick is in the egg, it notices that it has this very hard substance on its nose. And it has no idea why. It's the hardest material in its body. It seems out of place. It's certainly out of proportion. And whenever we have, and this is true about us, whenever we have a blank to add something in the blank, it's usually negative. Am I right? This is the first place we go. It's negative. If something happens, it's negative. It's negative. And so this little chick is thinking, maybe this is a malfunction. Maybe I was born with a malfunction. Maybe this is an abnormality that I have. It doesn't look right. What does it mean? And it continues to grow. When you're in a situation like that, there's, there's doubts. You can, see, you can understand why the doubts would creep in. We'll understand it better by and by, but this is not by and by yet. I don't understand it now. And that's why there's doubt. But the chick keeps growing. It grows. It matures. And now there's no more room in the egg. And the chick is cramped, and it can't fit, and it has to get out. And that's when it discovers the purpose of its beak. Because God created the chick in such a way that when it developed and grew, it would need to get out of that egg and could only get out by pecking it with its beak there are things sometimes that we have in our lives that we have no understanding. What does it mean? I don't understand. It's how it creates doubts. But the day is coming. And only God knows when that day is. The day is coming when there will be a breakthrough. Because we can no longer live in the environment that we are in. God has got a plan for an environment that's outside that the chick doesn't know anything about. And sometimes we got to go through stuff and we are getting ready. God is preparing us. He's bringing us to another level and he's going to get us ready to get outside, which we weren't even considering. And then suddenly we realize this is how God did it. He planned for it way back when I was just a tiny little chick in the egg. He was planning for the breakthrough. God's doing the same thing in your life. 
and he's doing the same thing in my life. That's where faith comes in. So when Noah had faith, this is the kind of, that's just, this is faith. Faith is believing what you can't see. But you have faith to believe. You can have doubts and still trust God. In fact, that's the only way to trust God. The reason why we're trusting God is because there are some doubts, there are some questions we don't have answers for, and we have to trust them. That's faith. The day came when somebody told Mary, your son has been arrested and is going on trial. She gathered her things and they, she went as soon as she could get there. The scripture takes us to the place of the cross. And she's at the cross. And this is what's going on in her mind. The angel told me, he shall be great. And of his kingdom, there shall be no end. But I'm looking at his end. Doubt. She sees her son and the heart is broken. And she's weeping. But the angel said, but, but look at the circumstances. sense that I don't understand what's going on but I'm going to hold on because not a, God is not a man that he would lie and if he gives me a promise somehow you know the, the story of, of doubting Thomas is it, it, really an interesting story because I'm so glad he was doubting because if it wasn't for the fact that he doubted I would be doing the doubting that he's doing so he does it for us and so Thomas is doubting he, he, he saw the miracles that Jesus performed he saw Jesus multiply the bread he even saw Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead but when Jesus died on the cross and they told him that he was resurrected he doubted. That's why they call him Doubting Thomas. Unless I see, he says, unless I could see, unless I could feel, I, I, don't, I can't believe, I can't get to the place where I could believe that he could possibly be raised from the dead after dying on that cross. And seven days later, Jesus walks into the upper room. And Doubting Thomas is not doubting anymore because he held on. He didn't change his doubts. He held on. He showed up. He came back to the upper room. He was still a disciple, a disciple with doubts, but it's about to change. To go. think there's a person here that hasn't had the experience where they had to doubt something that's human that's part of who we are if you have a, a, a good imagination you probably doubt even more because imagination takes over and imagination gives us a blank and we fill in the blank with the possibility of a problem and and the, and the wisdom is lord teach me to hold on teach me to hold on because after everything is said and done, God will come through. We, we, don't, we, we don't control his timing, but he will come through. Lord, we thank you that we can call on your name. Even in the midst of our doubts, 
we hold on because holding on is the only thing we can do. And every promise that you've ever made, you will fulfill. Even if it's not in our lifetime, if you made the promise, it will come to pass because you're God. I pray that you will give us that kind of faith that believes even though we don't see, even though we don't understand, even though we are confused, God will come through, just as he did in that first Christmas. Come through for us today. We pray it in Jesus' name and everybody said, and let this great son, S-O-N, come on in. <laughs>